Whether because of mighty marketing campaigns, years worth of build-up, or just a game story going in a certain direction, the game industry has a real love-slash-hate relationship with hype and expectation. To some degree, amping things up is just part and parcel of working in the media. Honestly, it's not until you start dissecting this stuff that you realize just how secretive and controlled the messaging of any game's release is. Just look at everything Bethesda have developed or published since introducing their new review policy. Until launch day, the majority of consumers have no idea what they're buying, and that extends into every exclusive screenshot, conceptual trailer, early beta, etc. With so much manufactured deception happening, to varying degrees of course, it inevitably leads to disappointment. Marketing is selling you a product, a game's runtime is weighted towards delivering the best early impressions, and stories don't always have a happy ending if a sequel could come instead. Regardless of whether what we end up with is better or worse, sometimes games can just fail to deliver on those original promises. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are 8 video game moments everyone was waiting for that didn't happen. Also note that spoilers will follow, check the description below to see which games I'll be covering. Number 8. Playing as Desmond in a modern day Assassin's Creed do you want to split a room? Ask them whether they prefer Assassin's Creed for the older, time period appropriate stuff, or the sci-fi, glyphs on the walls type stuff. And yes, of course, there'll always be those actual asylum patients who study all the god time travel Atlantis type stuff. Anyway, back to when the first Assassin's Creed game dropped. None of these wider fanbase groups had formed. We had a game set during the Crusades with equal parts past and present. Said present centered on Desmond, who through the bleeding effect of being jacked into his ancestors' memories was slowly becoming an assassin himself. Holy shish kebab, many of us thought, we're gonna get a game where we get to sprint between rooftops like a third person mirror's edge, with awesome stylish combat and the ability to climb anywhere. It'll be like Spider-Man but with hidden blades. After this, tons of fans claimed that they'd found proof that the messages left on Desmond's walls by Subject 16 actually narrowed everything down to New York City, setting everything up for that perfect sequel. Now to be fair, Ubisoft did kinda go near this stuff, having us get busted out of Abstergo in AC2, or doing a handful of missions in present day locales in AC3, but as for a full on parkour happy Assassin's Creed with a fully explorable New York, that never came and it probably never will. Number 7. Playing as Solid Snake in Metal Gear Solid 2 if you think the gaming industry is worse than ever for propagating lies now, you haven't seen what Hideo Kojima came up with across the 2000s. Back in the run-up to Metal Gear Solid 2, we saw entire fake trailers made with entirely fake assets to convince us that Solid Snake was the protagonist of the next Metal Gear. Scenes from aboard the tanker remained as the final version's prologue, but everything from Snake vs the Cyborg Ninja or him fighting Fortune just weren't true. Not to mention a thoroughly badass shot involving Snake taking on Metal Gear Ray on top of the sinking ship itself was totally gutted. And why? Because as Sons of Liberty's story was all about the cyclical nature of data, war, combat, and societal woes, Hideo Kojima decided to dupe us to make a point. I mean, fair play to the guy, but that also meant Snake's role was over after the opening level. It's forever testament to just how immaculately well-playing Metal Gear Solid 2 was that its reputation remains positive, though fans would have to wait until MGS2's substance to play as Snake for longer than half an hour. Number 6. Deacon and Sarah's Loving Reunion, Days Gone Days Gone might be the 8th generation's most divisive game. On the one hand, you've got this really unique open world attempt at horror, one with incredible sound design and dynamic jump scares depending on which freaker nests you stumble onto or which bandits find you first. On the other though is one of the worst paced narratives in quite some time. Centered on main man Deacon St. John searching for his wife Sarah, someone he just assumes is dead after an area he was told she'd be in is ransacked but he never found a body, we then spend a whopping 20 hours going point to point, doing chores and talking to NPCs, hoping for a clue. Now, keep those 20 hours in mind, and the fact that Deacon has gone slightly mad making a makeshift grave for Sarah out of rocks and twigs, trying to convince himself that she's gone just so that he can move on. It forms the basis for his character's inner turmoil, and he's in this state for what feels like a good few years. It should be the game's emotional high point then when he randomly stumbles upon Sarah at a research facility, and all that time spent believing can finally pay off. Only that doesn't happen. Deacon is undercover and can't really express any emotion in the moment, but Sarah appears to not recognize him. The whole scene is played as if the pair don't know each other, and even afterwards we get nothing of a payoff for such a built up moment. The whole thing kind of just happens and then you're back to doing open world stuff again. Like, really? That's that's it? That's all you've that's all you've got? Just video games, I guess. Number 5, Virtual Console on the Nintendo Switch. 
One of the absolute coolest features Nintendo have ever put out, especially on the all-emulating Wii U, was Virtual Console. Letting you dive into Game Boy Advance ports, NES classics, and everything in between, it was a dead cert that this feature would launch on the Nintendo Switch. I mean, seriously, what's better than access to a full Nintendo library on the go? It was even assumed that simply because the functionality is so flawless on the Wii U and 3DS, that Nintendo would just charge a monthly fee for access and we'd be away. Sadly, the compromise, as if one was needed, is Nintendo Switch Online, a monthly paid service that gives us some of the most forgettable games of all time. Like, yes, Super Mario, Kirby, and Metroid are all on here, but they're all from the NES. For so many titles on this service, you'll play them once for about 15 seconds and then realize that 30 plus year old game design very rarely holds up in the modern day. Nintendo, friend, buddy, old pal, what the living hell are you doing with this thing? Number four, flying like Iron Man, Anthem. You know, you could almost save Anthem if you just freed up the weird restrictions around its flight mechanics. Like, who in their right mind was conceptualizing this thing, taking months or years to get the flight physics down, and then limiting it to around 30 seconds a pop? All of Anthem's trailers and pre-release footage showed javelin suits barrel rolling and diving through luscious post-apocalyptic jungles, but when it came time to play ourselves, this happened. BioWare attempted to explain the feature's limited nature by saying that we could Arkham City ourselves from waterfall to waterfall, diving and gliding in between, but the whole thing was just so damn awkward. Plus, you're telling me that we have a world where walking tanks and jetpacks exist, but they can't stay active for more than a minute? Which part of that is fun? Number 3. Master Chief vs Spartan Lock – Halo 5 Guardians Following Halo 4's disastrous reception from diehard fans, though honestly it's actually pretty good, 343 Industries needed something big. They set about casting Master Chief as a convict and created an entire marketing campaign around something he did. We saw relative newcomer Spartan Locke on the hunt for the truth, and in twin commercials showed him about to execute the chief, where in the other it was the opposite. Whatever this showdown was, it was over something impactful and possibly even personal. Master Chief wouldn't betray the UNSC or otherwise destroy his status in the intergalactic military with one misguided action, or would he? Turns out that no, he wouldn't. The reason behind this quote-unquote manhunt was that Master Chief wanted to chase down Cortana as she dropped off the grid, with Locke just following in tow after being given specific orders. The entire marketing campaign was an over-exaggerated lie, kinda just clickbait, something designed to hook you in off the back of a narrative that clearly was never even part of the game in the first place. It's no wonder that Halo 5 sold the worst of the entire franchise, with Halo 6 now being something only interesting by virtue of curiosity. Number 2. Uniting the Races Against the Reapers – Mass Effect 3 Remember all that galaxy readiness stuff? The reason we were gallivanting across the cosmos to convince the warring races to work together? I always thought that was building to some endgame style final fight where everybody would battle alongside one another on screen. I thought we'd get the payoff to all that planning and all those multiplayer matches, with waves of Krogans charging into Reapers as Turians fired Thanax cannons from overhead. Maybe a handful of biotically charged Asari would fly down and get their Captain Marvel on. Instead, after a good 60 to 80-ish hours of game time across all three games, the final 15 minutes of Mass Effect 3 centered on an AI called the Star Child and… look, we all know this story at this point. The more fascinating thing is that even the majority of Bioware didn't want this ending either. Read into the development of Mass Effect 3 and you'll come across tales of mismanagement, of original endings being scrapped because higher-ups were afraid that an earlier leak had spoilt it for the majority. You'll find stories of a creative team struggling to make ends meet within Bioware, executing on a vision for how the franchise should go, with the corporate wider appeal wanting whims of EA breathing down their necks. To this day, I can't fathom why Mass Effect isn't as widespread as Star Wars, why EA have neglected to release HD or 4K remasters for newer platforms, and why even Mass Effect Andromeda was treated as a glorified multiplayer one-off. Mass Effect deserves better, and the reason I keep bringing up the series on lists like this is to eventually see more of it done right. And number 1. Finding Bigfoot in GTA San Andreas the result of an imaginative pop culture being given a game world far bigger than anything they'd ever seen before, back in 2004, stories emerged from all directions as to what lay in San Andreas' back or beyond. UFOs and Leatherface were common, but the biggest lie of all came from school playgrounds the Western Hemisphere over, that Bigfoot himself was in the game. You have to remember that this was a time before broadband connections or social media. Modders injecting character models into custom builds only fueled the fires as teenagers started reading quote-unquote guides as to where the mysterious Sasquatch might show up. If you go to this tree at this time of night and then face this direction, you'll see him. I tried this stuff for weeks. Everyone always has that one friend in school who lies about everything, and of course they ran into Bigfoot but they just couldn't snap a picture or provide evidence, leaving the rest of us to keep trying. 
Of course, in the end, Bigfoot was never in the game, but Rockstar dedicated an entire set of cutscenes to him in GTA V, specifically in response to just how overblown all these assumptions and rumors became. You can say what you like about the internet's effect on society, at least we aren't chasing imaginary Sasquatches in the middle of the night anymore. And that is my list. Let me know down in the comments if there were any other built-up story moments that just didn't come to fruition. Ivan Scott from WhatCulture.com. Please subscribe to the WhatCulture Gaming Podcast channel, and I'll catch you soon.